you know, you've thought a lot and you've looked a lot at this literature and you, you know, mm -hmm. one can, one can say, look, the epidemiology is so overwhelming. Correct. That, that it's, I mean, the hazard ratios are, are sort of absurd, yep. right? When we, when we're used to looking at a field like nutrition and looking at the hazard ratios in nutrition, they're very small. In fact, they're so Correct. small, um, and also so inconsistent that it becomes almost impossible to assign a mortality benefit or Correct. addition to almost anything you can eat. I mean, literally, jelly beans to bacon to kale, the hazard ratios are trivial and they flip-flop from month to month. Correct. Well, and, and, and yeah, let me tell you something that's really interesting. It's good you brought this up. So I'm working on a review article on related topics. And one of the things I'm looking at is all of what you might describe as natural experiments. Yeah. Uh, where you have two groups of people that are otherwise similar exposed to different things. And that's a long, long, uh, long used tool in epidemiology. And, and people are now using it in economics and behavioral sciences. And in fact, these natural experiments, uh, the economist just got a Nobel Prize for them a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But the classic one is the, is the London bus driver, bus conductor story led by Jeremy Morris uh, after World War II, where they showed the physically active conductors who were walking up and down the the buses all day had much lower rates of cardiovascular disease than the, the sedentary uh, Driver. bus drivers. Yeah. And it was about 50%. And they had similar things with telephone operators versus people who were out walking around doing things. And what's interesting is it, you look at that 50%, it's, it's incredibly consistent, incredibly consistent. Those studies, studies of longshoremen, studies of Harvard alumni, uh, there's one in the last uh, 10 or 15 years of uh, 50,000 male and 25,000 female finishers of the Vasa Lopet 90 kilometer cross country ski race in Sweden. And they compared them to match controls from the Swedish record system. And they showed, again, about a 50% reduction in cardiovascular and all cause mortality. There's data from the National Cancer Institute showing the same sorts of things and showing, you know, four, five, or six your increase in life expectancy, uh, you know, among the people who who got a substantial amount of physical activity or structured exercise, either one. Yeah, and I, I think the the sort of take home point for the listener is, the, unlike nutritional epidemiology, where the risk increases and risk reductions are very very small. And they're never consistent, right? They, you know, right. I mean, there's some things that are consistent and consistently small. Uh, for example, you know, vegetarians consistently have a small reduction in mortality, which of course then gets to the next point, which is what are the confounders? And this is where I want to kind of talk about it with right. exercise. Um, and this is where the natural experiments are much better on the exercise front than they are on the nutrition right. front. You see, going back to the example you gave, which is a very famous one of the, uh, the, the, the guys running up and down the buses, the sort of conductor yep. guys versus the drivers. That's a great natural experiment, um, because it's really not amenable to a choice. And you, right. would, you would be less likely to believe that the bus driver who sits there is also making poor choices relative to the other guy when he's not at work. Well, uh, in other words, do, we wouldn't really have a reason to believe that he's more likely to be a smoker. He's more likely to eat, you know, make poor food choices, et correct. cetera. Whereas when you look at sort of the vegetarian to non-vegetarian uh, dietary pattern in nutrition, it's pretty clear that a vegetarian diet is a very restrictive diet. And therefore the person who's making that choice is likely very health conscious in a number of other ways. Correct. Some yeah, of which they are have a easy to, behaviors. Yeah, exactly. Some of yeah. which are easy to measure and correct for, like smoking, but many of which are not. And and correct. that's what sort of makes the nutritional thing harder. Uh, the exercise thing is pretty profound. So let's let's explain to people what it means when you have a hazard ratio of 0.5, which means a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality. What's the time frame that that's usually looking at, and how does that translate to you know a five-year increase in life expectancy? The the way you would say it is is that you know the relative risk of dying of of heart disease in any any given period of time, whether it's year, five years, ten years, whatever the study is doing is is 50% lower. But now obviously, not everybody dies of cardiovascular disease. People die of other things. And so then you have to trans translate that into sort of light years of life gained. And typically the years of life gained are somewhere on, 
on on the order if you account for smoking of three to five years, something like that. And then if you you look at um, the concept of health span, you know you may get six or eight years of of improved health span. So health span, as you know, Peter, is is how long you can you know how disability free you are. And, and so you have you know four or five year increase in life expectancy and a four or five year additional increase in health span. And the idea, you know, is to live a long time and then die quickly with minimal disability.